Hello, it's April from April's Home, and today I'm here to share with you my Gingerbread Boy cookie recipe. I'm going to be making gingerbread boys as well as some woodland animal cutouts with this recipe. I've been making this every year for over 25 years, and also this is the recipe that my mother used and my grandmother used. So this is a tried and true, very old fashioned gingerbread cookie recipe. I really love it. There are some very simple ingredients and a few little tricks to keep the cookies nice and soft, and I'll go ahead and share that with you. Before we get started, let's go ahead and talk about the ingredients that we'll need. You will need shortening. I prefer the shortening sticks because they're easy to measure. We'll need allspice, of course ginger, ground ginger for uh, gingerbread boys, and cloves, and cinnamon. So nice, uh, spicy, cinnamony cookie. You'll need salt, baking soda, brown sugar, molasses, and you'll need flour. You'll also need a little bit of water, and I'll share the amounts of all of the ingredients as I add it to the dough. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start by mixing my dry ingredients and spices in this bowl, and then I'll set it to the side. Oh, also you will need a um, electric mixer like this, just a good old electric hand mixer there. And also, we won't be baking this right away, so you don't have to worry about preheating your oven at first. You will need some saran wrap or a Ziploc bag to put this dough in when it's finished because it does have to chill for a bit. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with the dry ingredients. So we'll start with six cups of flour. There's our second cup. third cup, fourth cup, fifth cup, and our sixth cup. Then we will need two teaspoons of baking soda. Here's one, and I like to kind of pour it over the top of the flour so it distributes. You wouldn't want to end up with a big clump and then the second teaspoon. And every, um, all the other dry ingredients will only need one teaspoon each, so one teaspoon of salt. And I will go ahead and include all of the um, ingredients for this recipe in the description box below. So here's our teaspoon of salt. And as I add the ingredients, I set them off to the other side so that I don't add it twice. Now I'll need a thinner uh, measuring spoon because I'll be getting into my smaller spice jars and I'm going to get a teaspoon of allspice. Allspice is one of my favorite spices. You can see I go through it quite frequently. And I will say um, it does help if you buy fresh spices. I didn't this year because I really want to use up what I have. Um, but typically I will buy nice fresh spices when I'm baking. But these are all still really nice and fragrant so I think that these are fine. So here's our teaspoon of allspice. And then next we'll do a teaspoon of ginger. Here's our teaspoon of ginger. And a teaspoon of cloves. Because I don't want to reuse the same um, measuring spoon so that I don't uh, co-mingle the spices, I'm gonna use two half teaspoons. There's one half a teaspoon and a second half to make one teaspoon of cloves. And lastly, we have a teaspoon of cinnamon. Okay, and a teaspoon of cinnamon. So there is our beautiful fragrant spice mix. It starts to smell like Christmas the minute you start mixing these up. This was a recipe, like I said, that my grandma and mother made when I was a child. And my grandma and mother would have these cookies pretty much available all through the month of December. Um, my grandma would just make batches and batches. My mom, I know, would probably make a couple of batches as well. This year, I usually only make one or two batches a year all at once towards closer to Christmas, but this year I thought I would like my grandson to try these out a little sooner into the month of December, so I'm making these sooner in the month. I'm gonna take one of my little uh, measuring spoons here. This one's clean. I'm just gonna kind of incorporate these ingredients together. Just like I said, so we don't have any big clumps of anything. Just kind of stir that around, incorporate the spices into the flour, as well as the baking soda and salt. And then when we're done incorporating this all together, 
we will go ahead and set this to the side and get our wet ingredients mixed up. So there is our flour mixture ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and set that off to the side. And I have another bowl here ready to go. And now we're going to combine our sugars and our shortening. Okay, the first thing I'm going to go ahead and add is the molasses here. This recipe calls for a cup and a half of molasses. And I've shared this in a video before. The way I like to get sticky ingredients out of a measuring cup is to give it a little spritz with some uh, pan spray, some cooking spray. So we'll go ahead and pour in our first cup. Delicious smell of molasses there. Okay, so here's our first cup of molasses. See how nicely that comes out. It's not terribly sticking in the measuring cups. You're sure to get the majority of it out. And I'm going to go ahead and give it another little spritz. We have a little bit left in there, but that's okay. Then I'm just going to eye another half cup. It's probably close to this whole little jar. But let's go ahead and measure this out and see if we can get the full half cup here. So we have our other half cup here. And it did take this entire 12 ounce um, jar of molasses. This is one of the little skinnier jars. Let's make sure we get all that good molasses out. Just going to go ahead and scoop a little bit out with this measuring spoon. And get that right to the sink. So there's our molasses. And now for our shortening. The nice thing about these shortenings is that they have the measurements right here on the side. And we will need a third cup of shortening. So I've already measured that out from one I had open from a recipe the other day. So there's a third cup of shortening. And then we will need a cup of uh, packed brown sugar. I'm going to pull this forward here. So I'm going to wipe up this molasses a little bit so I don't get it on my sugar tub. This is a little quarter cup measure that we just keep in our brown sugar. So I'm going to go ahead and pack four of these for one cup of brown sugar. So there's one quarter cup, two, three, and four. So one cup of brown sugar. So we're going to go ahead now and use the electric mixer to blend this together. And at the end of blending this together, I'll add a little water to this as well. But now I'm going to go ahead and get this all blended together. So you want to make sure to keep blending this until you see that the sugar and the molasses and the shortening are all um, thoroughly combined. You don't want to see little pieces of shortening in it. I'm going to knock down some of the sugar on the sides. Give that one last little blend. And now I'm going to go ahead and add two-thirds of a cup of water. So there's one-third and two-thirds. Then I'm going to go ahead and blend this on low together. I like to go really low so we don't splash water around. And if it looks like it's going to be splashy, you could turn this off Kind of go around by hand a little bit to get some of that water incorporated and then turn the electric mixer back on. You can see that the fat kind of rises to the top of this. That's okay. It's going to just incorporate nicely when we add in our dry ingredients. And just for good measure, I'm going to kind of clean up the sides here a little bit and then go ahead and blend that a little bit more. You can see it's really wet here, so you don't want to have that on high. It will splash everywhere. Okay. Now we're going to go ahead and add the dry ingredients and get that blended in. Just so that it doesn't overwhelm my mixer, I'm going to go ahead and ha add in half at a time. So we'll add about half of the flour mixture now. And I've done this in the past where I just add it all at once, but... Um, Sometimes it can be a little overwhelming for the motor in the mixer. And I imagine if you were using a KitchenAid mixer that maybe you wouldn't run into that. A KitchenAid stand mixer that is with a little bit of a heavier duty motor. But uh, just for the ease of cleanup, I love to just use my little hand mixer here. So now I'm going to blend the first half in. Again, you want to go slow at first so you don't blow the flour everywhere.
And now we can add in the last half of the flour mixture. Okay, and I'll go ahead and continue blending until this is all thoroughly mixed. I always start out in the center, but then I make sure to bring fresh flour from around the outsides into the inner portion so that we're not forgetting to mix in everything from the outside. You can hear that it's starting to be a little difficult on the motor here. So you just want to kind of take it easy if you're using a hand mixer like this. Sometimes I like to turn it off and kind of reposition it. I'm going to take a few minutes with my uh, spatula here, my rubber spatula, to kind of bring in some of this excess of flour from the outside here to make sure that it all gets blended together. You don't want to leave a bunch of flour at the bottom or on the sides. This will also give my little motor a break. We're getting this all mixed together. I'm going to go ahead and push out, clear out the little mixer beaters here and then give it another go. You can see that the flour is starting to be almost completely mixed in. We have a little bit here on the side, so I'll get that mixed the rest of the way. And then use my rubber spatula to make sure none is left on the bottom. Okay, and one last little mix. And I think we're all mixed up and good to go. So I'm going to clear out the beaters here again. We'll move this to the side, and I like to kind of bring it all to the center of the bowl a little bit. Again, double check that the all the flour is mixed in. Kind of get it into a bit of a round little shape here. Now I'm going to go ahead and set this aside, clean off my uh, little work surface here. It has a little bit of dough splattered about. Then I'm going to lay out some uh, plastic wrap and show you how I get this all wrapped up to chill in the refrigerator. So I've cleared off my counter and I've laid two strips of uh, plastic wrap out here on my counter and I've kind of overlapped them by about this much here so it makes a nice big square and I'm going to take my um, dough here and turn it out into the center of this Then I'm going to use my spatula here, my rubber uh, scraper, to kind of press it into a roundish shape. So we're going to let this chill in the fridge for minimum one hour, probably overnight is best. But today I'm going to be baking it later on this evening. So I'm just going to chill it for a few hours. But again, you can chill this overnight. I've even chilled it for a couple of days if I couldn't get right to it. So there we have it in a nice big round circle. I'm going to cover one end like so, and then fold this other part over. And there we have our dough all ready for the fridge. So I'm going to go ahead and let this chill for a few hours and then come back to show you how I bake it up. Okay, so I'm back and the dough has chilled in the fridge for about three hours or so. It's nice and firmed up here. Again, you can leave this in the fridge overnight or even for like two days. Um, before you roll it out. So um, it's all here and I've lined my work surface with wax paper, two overlapping sheets of wax paper. If you have a countertop that works better for just rolling out dough on, that's fine too, but for my counter it's just best to put down a little surface protector here. I like to use a little bit of wax paper. And then I've got my bin of flour there, which I will use to sprinkle over the surface as well as put a little pile at the top there to dunk my cookie cutters in. I've picked out a cute assortment of cookie cutters. I've got my moose and a bear and a mushroom and a hedgehog, a fox, a little elf, and a little squirrel. And I believe most of these came from Ikea. And I also have a standard just gingerbread cutout shape. 
And then I also like to do some house shape ones as well, sort of like a gingerbread house shaped one here. So what I like to do first is I'll flower my surface here in just a minute and then I cut this dough into four so that I can work with one quarter at a time so that I'm when I'm re-rolling it after cutting it I'm not introducing so much flour into the whole thing each time. Um, it kind of preserves the dough so I like to work in it uh, with this dough a quarter at a time. So I'm gonna go ahead and flour my surface, unwrap my dough here, cut a quarter of it out and then I'll show you how I get that rolled out. I also, by the way, have the oven preheating to 350 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's the temperature that these uh, gingerbread cutouts will cook at. So you need plenty of flour for this cookie recipe. The dough can be a little bit uh, wet and want to stick on your rolling surface, so I do like to start out with a good amount of flour, and then again I put a pile up at the top here to uh, tap my cookie cutters in like so. It helps them to go into the um, dough a little easier and then come out. So that's how I start with that. I also roll my um, rolling pin in the flour too to kind of start off with just to help again with that uh, sticking. So here's a quarter of the dough and the rest I keep covered in the saran. And I just kind of roll this around in the flour until it's coated on all sides. Again, this is a little bit of a wet dough and it will stick if you don't get it floured at first. So there's a that, and we'll get that started with the rolling pin here now. See if I can do this at an angle so that I don't get in the way of the camera here. I need a new rolling pin here. I'm planning on getting a regular wooden one. I've had this old plastic one for quite a while. You fill it with water, helps give it some weight, but I do think I want to just get a standard um, wooden rolling pin here coming up. But this one will do for now. And it has worked just fine for many years. But it's a little bit, it doesn't have a ton of weight, so you really have to kind of lean on it here but a wooden rolling pin might not be quite like that. So you don't want to roll this dough too thin or the cookies will be a little bit on the hard side. Um, this is probably maybe a little less than a quarter of an inch, about like that. So then I like to just kind of line up my cutters here and place them in and I use a variety each time. We'll get a gingerbread man there or person little squirrel little elf a mushroom and if you lay them all out like this you can get the most in at a time um, although if you're wanting to make a uh, extra, I always like to make quite a few of the gingerbread people. So sometimes I'll just cut one whole one just of the people. So I have plenty of those. And it looks like we can fit in this little bear. So now I have my baking sheet and I've lined it with parchment. And I like to get that nearby. And you just kind of wiggle these and slightly pinch the cookie uh, cutter to hold the dough in. And then I like to tap or brush off a little bit of that flour so that the cookie's not covered with flour when it comes out of the oven. But it made it nice so it didn't stick. And then very gently ease it out of the form. You want to be especially careful with the little arms and things like that. So here's our first little elf. We'll lay him on the tray. Our little bear. And in this case, the cutter came out, but the dough didn't come with it, so I'll just kind of ease the dough to the side and gently lift it, making sure to kind of brush off that excess flour. Here's our gingerbread person. There's our little squirrel and our little hedgehog. And it looks like up here there's room for another hedgehog. So we'll go ahead and do that, and that should fill up the first tray. So we have our tray full here, and you could probably squeeze those a little bit closer, but we don't want them so close that they they touch if they expand at all. This recipe doesn't super expand. They do puff up a little bit, but they don't expand a lot. I could probably fit another one in there, but for the sake of getting going, I'm going to go ahead and put this one in the oven, 
at 350 degrees for about 12 to 14 minutes. You'll know when they're done that when you lightly touch them, it doesn't leave an imprint. So if you tap on them lightly and it leaves an imprint, it probably needs a little bit longer in the oven. Now I'm going to go ahead and get these in a 350 degree oven for about 12 to 14 minutes. And I'll come back and show you what these look like um, when they're all done. And while these are baking, I will re-roll this out and show you how I do that and get ready for the next batch. Okay, so the next batch you just kind of pull the dough back into the center here. And this time it's got a little bit more flour on it from the bottom, so it won't be as wet. You just kind of knead it together a little bit. And I kind of like to form it back into a disc. And if you notice some of the pieces not sticking together, kind of work them in a bit. And then you want to recover your surface, just kind of brush back the flour over it. So we have a little bit of flour over the surface. Pat that dough down in the center, and then roll it back out. You can see why I like to only re-roll with a quarter at a time because each time you roll it, it gets a little, the dough gets a little bit different. So I don't like to re-roll all of the dough repeatedly, just a quarter at a time. We'll go ahead and get our mousse in here. And our fox. And I think our squirrel will fit right in. So when I'm baking these, I work with two trays at a time, so that way I can cut out and roll the next tray while the first one is baking. Occasionally, if they come out of the uh, cutter a little bit bent, you can just bend them back into place the way you like it. The mousse here is a little bit tricky because of the antlers. Getting all the dough out can be kind of tricky. You really want to make sure to flour this enough. Let's see if I did. his legs also, so I like to give those a little extra hand. And there we go. The moose will definitely need a little rearranging there. His back leg got a little bent, but there we go. And then you can see we already have to re-roll this. We got three cookies out of that one. And we'll re-roll this again. Recover the surface with flour. And we'll keep rolling this and cutting out cookies until we have just a little bit left. And then we'll leave the little bit left until we roll out the next quarter and mix it in after the first time of cutting that out. So we'll cut out a gingerbread person here. And then this already has to be re-rolled. I think I'll be able to get a squirrel and maybe a little hedgehog out of this. There we go. Okay, and we've got our second tray ready to go. Since this is a pretty small amount of dough, I'm going to set this to the side, and again, I'll incorporate this back in after I roll out my second quarter, cut the first ones out, and then I have to re-roll that one. That's when I'll incorporate that in. Since we'll be starting with a new quarter, it'll need a little bit more flour. And again, with a new um, quarter piece here, a new piece of dough, we'll go ahead and cover that with flour for its first rolling. There we go. We have a next, the next quarter ready to roll out and get cut out, but I'm going to go ahead and let this sit here for a bit while the first batch cooks, and then I'll start rolling it out when I pull that first batch out and put the second batch in. Okay, so my first batch is out of the oven, you can see here, and the flour here, you can brush that off once they're cooled down. I just uh, brush off the flour before I decorate them. So now I'm going to go ahead and let these cool completely while I'm baking the rest of the cookies. As you can see here, I've rolled out the second batch here and started to get some of my cookie cutters in. I've left a space here because I'd like to do two gingerbread boys, but before I transfer these to the other pan, I'm going to let it cool down a bit, at least for probably half the time that the next batch is in. So like six or seven minutes, I like to let that cool so that it doesn't start cooking the cookies before I get them in the oven. So I'm going to let these sit here for a bit while the pan cools. Then we'll get our next batch going and I'll come back when I re-roll this to show you how I incorporate the dough from the first quarter. Okay, so we've done the cutting out from this first um, roll out of the second quarter of dough. Here's the little bit that was left from the first quarter and we will just put this in with this and kind of just mix it all together. And there you go. So that's how you do it. You just keep working through all the dough, rolling it out, um, cutting it out, re-rolling it until you're all out of dough. 
You bake them all until they're done and let them cool completely. And I'll come back to share with you how I pack those up. I always make sure to pack them up when they're thoroughly cooled in a container with a few slices of white bread. Uh, just classic white bread, just like this variety here from uh, Walmart that I picked up. So let's take a few slices of that and pack it in with the cookies. It um, pulls the moisture from the white bread and it kind of puts it into the cookies. So it's sort of a trade out and the cookies are nice and soft and delicious. And I will, um, so I'll show you how I get that packed up when they're all cooled and baked and ready to pack up. And then when they're all ready to be frosted, nice and soft and ready to go, I'll get those all laid out, mix up a batch of icing and show you how I um, decorate these cookies. So I'll be back when these are all baked and show you how I pack them up. So I have finished baking all of my gingerbread cutouts here. You can see a lot of different animals and gingerbread people and different things like that. So they are also all cooled off now and ready to be packed up. And again, to get these to pack up, so they're actually pretty soft right now, but I do like them to be nice and soft, so they're really good and chewy and good with the frosting and everything like that. So I'm gonna get some wax paper here and some bread, like I said. I'm going to go ahead and get these into a, a tote um, that I'll line with wax paper, and then I'll do a layer of cookies and maybe add a little um, slice of bread and then cover it with, cover the first layer with some wax paper and do another layer and so on and so forth. So I'll go ahead and um, get that process started and show you what that looks like. Okay, so here is my tote. This is not a food safe tote. If you have a nice big food safe tote, that would be better. I just get a nice clean um, storage tote. I give it an extra clean and then I line the bottom again with wax paper. I do this because I make a pretty big batch here that I like to have all laid out. This is not how I store them once they're frosted, but this is how I like to store them while I let them soften with their bread. And also I like to wait a day or two before frosting them. It allows the spices in the cookie to kind of blossom more. So then they taste extra um, good and spicy and wonderful. So here's the first layer here. Now I'm gonna go ahead and cover this with a, a layer of um, wax paper. Then I'll put another layer of cookies out. Here's the second layer. I've put the bread on the opposite side. I've left a little bit of room around the edges of this wax paper um, so that the air can really circulate around all of these cookies here. And I also, if, the, if a cookie is near the bread, it has to be on wax paper. You don't want the cookie directly leaning on the bread at all. It will soften the cookie way too much. So I'm gonna just keep building these layers here until we get this all filled up and all the cookies in here. And then I'll close the lid, put a final layer of wax paper on the top, then close the lid and let these sit overnight and soften up and season a bit. This time I'm only gonna let them sit overnight because I want these for our family dinner night tomorrow. So I'm gonna frost them in the morning. But again, normally you can leave them like this for a day or two. Um, while you uh, wait until you're ready to frost them. Okay, so I've got all my cookies in this uh, tote here, layered up with bread. I ended up using four slices of bread. That should soften it up nicely. Again, I'm gonna put the lid on this, close it up, leave it for the night, and I'll come back tomorrow to mix up the icing, lay these out, and show you how I get them all frosted up and ready to go. Okay, so the cookies have been sitting overnight in this tote with bread, and the bread is a little bit firmer, and the cookies are nice and soft. So they're ready to get frosted. I'm going to go ahead and lay them out on the wax paper on my table here so that I have a nice work surface covered in gingerbread boys. But now I'll go ahead and go into the kitchen and share with you how I make the icing. So we're ready to make the icing for the gingerbread cutouts. I have a bowl here, my electric um, mixer, and a bag of confectioner's sugar or powdered sugar. This is a 32 ounce bag and we'll use about half of it, but I always like to have the whole bag just in case I uh, add too much milk and then it becomes too uh, runny, then I add a little bit more frosting until I get the consistency just right. We'll need a little bit of this shortening here. We'll need some milk and some vanilla extract. Okay, so I've poured a little bit more than half of the bag of uh, powdered sugar into the bowl here. And I think I'll use about a third of a stick here of shortening. That might be a little bit too much. You could start out with a little bit less and mix more in if you want to, but I think a third will be fine. And I'm just going to add a little bit of milk at a time. This is probably like 
maybe a quarter of a cup. And I measure my vanilla by the capful, about a teaspoon. But just we'll start with one capful and then I'll taste it if it needs a little bit more vanilla, which sometimes it does. If it tastes just a little bit too sugary, then I add a little bit more vanilla. If you want your icing to be pure white, you want to use a clear vanilla extract. I've never had any of that and I don't mind it being a little bit off-white. So that's what this looks like. Now we're going to go ahead and blend this up until it's nice and smooth. You want to start low on your blender so that it doesn't um, spread powdered sugar everywhere. And if you notice it's too thick, just drizzle in a little bit of milk at a time. You're looking for a consistency that can be piped out and um, hold its shape. So you want it to be thin enough to be pipeable, but not so thin that it's running everywhere. I've turned up the speed a little bit as it's all blended together now to get a nice whipped consistency and really make sure that we're working that shortening all the way through. And just so you can see, it's probably a little bit too thick at this point, so I'll probably still add a little bit more milk, but first I'm going to get it blended up as nicely as I can. I'm just going to add a drop more milk here off to the side so we don't splash it. Continue blending them until it's nice and smooth. So in order to tell the consistency, I just kind of use a spoon to spread around in it to see how well this adheres to the spoon and it looks pretty close. So I think we have the taste just right and I'm worried that it is just a little bit too thin so I might add in a little bit of uh, powdered sugar, just a little sprinkle more of powdered sugar, maybe another quarter cup and then I'm going to get this all blended together. Sometimes you have to go back and forth. You'll add a little bit of powdered sugar and you've made it too thick. Then you just add a little bit of milk. You can keep going with that until you get the consistency that you like. And now to make a piping bag, you just need a Ziploc freezer bag here, just like this. I like to have a little container like a large cup or a bowl, or in this case a mixing or a measuring cup. Put the tip of the bag down in there and fill it with frosting so it goes down into one corner of the bag. You can use regular um, icing paper and make it that way, but this way is really easy and the cleanup is really easy for me. So I've just done it like this for years. So I'm going to go ahead and get this all filled up, squeeze it down to the end here, and then cut off the tip and we'll go out to the room where I have all the cookies laid out and we'll get those frosted. Okay, so here are my cookies and here's the frosting all worked down to the tip of this bag. And this frosting does feel a little bit... Um, thinner than I normally make, so we will see how this works, but you just cut off the teeny little bit of this tip, just enough so that you can ice around these cookies, and I'll kind of ice a few to show you how I do that. I just like to trace around the edge of each cookie. It sometimes takes me a little while to get the hang of it, but by the end of frosting these I'll have it all down, and then I usually give it a little eye, and then sometimes I'll add in another little detail just so we have a little bit of extra frosting because it's good. And then we'll go around the border of the gingerbread boy. You can also make little outfits for these if you want. My mother used to um, decorate these with colored frosting and you can add color to this frosting just with food coloring. And she would do really intricate outfits on all of her gingerbread people and make cute hair. And my grandma did that too. Very cute gingerbread people. Just work through however you want. Give it some eyes. Maybe a mouth and a nose. And then some buttons. You could also give it gloves. And little shoes. There's a house. We'll just go around the outside of the house here. That's so cute. We'll give it a door and a window. You can hear my cute little grandson in the background. He's watching uh, me frost these cookies. He's going to try his first gingerbread boys this year. And maybe you can add some little snow down at the bottom.
and a doorknob. So you just keep going like that until you're all done and just be creative with how you um, feel like icing them. There's all sorts of different things you could do. You could add currants or uh, red hot candies for eyes and nose if you wanted to. But I just like to stick with icing. And I like all white icing because I just think it looks really pretty. Okay, so I'll come back and show you what these look like when they're all done. Okay, so we've got these all frosted up, the whole family pitched in and got these frosted. And the important thing is that you have fun and get some good frosting on there. It's not about perfection. It's just about having a fun time making delicious gingerbread boys, but that's why I love the white frosting all together. These always look absolutely adorable and they taste delicious and smell like Christmas. So now I'm gonna go ahead and let this frosting set up a bit and then we'll put it on the tray and I'll be back to show you what that looks like. And here are the cookies out on the tray. You can see we've got a selection of them here. So here they are all ready to enjoy. And to store these, I like the frosting to fully set up. Probably be good to let these, uh, let the frosting set up for a few hours and then you can pack them away in uh, a big cookie container. I like to do a thin layer and um, in between the layers, add some wax paper there and just try to set them in a way that it's not squishing the frosting. And these cookies last for a really long time. They don't go stale very quickly. And in fact, as they um, are stored, the spices improve with age. So those are gingerbread cookies. I hope you enjoyed taking a look at this recipe. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Hit subscribe for more videos from April's home. Thank you so much for watching and I'll talk to you later. Goodbye.